for many, many months, possibly even years, if I thought about them all, I could hear in my mind's eye, I could hear the noise of the jag going past under the Dunlop Bridge at Le Mans. That lovely singing, singing note of the big six. Nothing like it. I followed my friend Ron into the team because we'd been associated in his motor racing and as I'd known him since 1940. I knew him very well, I knew his family and, and we used to do things together quite apart from, from motoring. He was seen as being a good driver and being, a, being an Edinburgh Scot, he, he was naturally a target for David Murray, who, who was an Edinburgh man, you see himself and we we didn't actually ask for a seat David Murray asked him to drive for him I got to know the team owners and they allowed me to go with them and paid for me to go with them to a number of events but the only event for a Curie course that I actually went to and, and was subsidized for was Le Mans 57 For the 25th time, cars are lined up for scrutineering at Le Mans. At least, I presume they used to do something like this in the days when cars were raced here for the first time in 1923. Perhaps, like the track itself, this procedure has been altered almost out of recognition. Certainly today, it is a highly organized form of chaos, which gives most entrants nasty moments before their cars get safely through the various traps and pitfalls in the regulations. Ecuria Coss has two entries this year, one to be driven by last year's winner, Ron Flockhart, with Ivor Bueb as partner. It was something that I had known about ever since I was a boy, and not only was it the first time I'd been to Le Mans, but it happened that the first time I was on the inside. I was fully acquainted with stopwatch work because I'd been doing it for BRM. And, of course, we were surrounded by all the activities of the teams. So there was a tremendous amount going on, and, and perhaps one got a bit impatient. Now, let's get on with it. Let's get all these people out of the way. Let's get the drivers. Let's get the drivers ready. Over 50 cars in the hands of some of the finest drivers in the world are getting ready to celebrate this half century of mechanical progress. The voters I have are very restricted. I was using a Zeiss Iconta camera. I think it would have been one film only, which at that time would have been eight exposures. I took three or four before the start from the pit counter. I got up on the pit counter and I took two or three pictures, which I'll show you. At the time I thought, oh my God, they'd look dull. But now after 60 years, you think, hmm, was that what it was like then? And you realize you've got something which in fact is quite interesting because it doesn't happen every day. Jean Debienne has moved up into second place with Bueb in number three Jaguar, splitting the Aston Martins. 
Once again, the race is being run in Grand Prix temper. And one wonders just how long the leading cars can keep it up without doing themselves serious harm. The steadily circulating Jaguar, number three, is in first place. After less than three hours of the 24, the fury of the onslaught by the Italian cars is largely spent. At Tete Rouge, the Melioli Porsche lies on one side and the inverted Aston Martin on the other. The shadows lengthen and we get ready for the darkness. The cars come past absolutely at full speed, probably 150, 160 miles an hour, and you're just standing there. We probably didn't realise the dangers we were up against, but everybody did it. There were rows of people standing along the edge of the circuit in these cars going past. The thing is with keeping lap charts and timing is that you've got to be doing it all the time. You're looking through people's legs because they're, they, the team team owners probably standing up on the pit counter yelling at the chaps down below. You can imagine what it's like at night, it's even worse. Immediately you've got to pick up the, the numbers as they go past because once they've gone, they've gone. You can't just look up the road and say that's so and so, he's gone. <laughs> After a while I could sort out the Jaguar drivers and if I thought I'd missed one of our cars going past for the lap chart, instantly I knew because he wouldn't lift off. And this was most impressive. Ron was one of those who didn't lift off going up through the curve. They were brave. Since the night before, the Jaguars have built up a resounding lead. The two entered by the Ecuria Cos, numbers 3 and 15, along with three other privately owned Jaguars, are making the pace. Five Jaguars on the leaderboard. <laughs> is now more than eight laps ahead of the car immediately behind and is sure of victory. All the time there was the thought, are they going to do it? Is everything going to be all right? And as it so happened, both cars went beautifully the whole race. Jaguar number three continues on its triumphant way, victorious against time, fatigue, darkness and mist. Once again, the leader comes in for the usual treatment. Ron Flockhart has taken over the wheel for the last time. A record average of 113.8 miles an hour over a record distance of 2,731 miles. Congratulations to Air Curia Cost Chief David Murray and to his drivers, Ivor Buell, Ron Flockhart, Jock Lawrence and Ninian Sanders. This is a famous victory for Britain. Many congratulations. We are very, very proud. The fifth Jaguar victory and the 11th British victory at Le Mans. As soon as the race was over, you, you felt all of a sudden the pressure gone. And of course it was so totally un, unusual, it was something that had never happened to me before and certainly there would never have been a first time again. And I, 
I've still got in my mind's eye, I've got the picture of all these, all these mature people in floods of tears. Funny, isn't it? One should remember that. I have been really quite humbled by the fact that Clive Beecham thought so much of me from what he had heard that he was prepared to have his cars brought over here and to come up here himself from London on the train with these people and to spend the day. I mean, I was, I was the VIP, I suppose, really, for the day. I've never been a VIP in my life before. Uh, and th this, this was really, as I say, uh, quite humbling, quite humbling. Big seekers. Nothing like it. <laughs>